Good evening, everyone. My name is Serena Longo, Marketing Coordinator at Harvard Bookstore, Harvard Square's landmark independent bookstore. I'm also a proud Vermonter. <laughs> and tonight, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, Boston Review, and the MIT Department of Political Science, I'm honored to welcome you to this evening's event with Senator Bernie Sanders. <laughs> He'll be discussing his book, Our Revolution, A Future to Believe in. We're also joined this evening by WGBH Forum Network, here filming and live streaming tonight's event. So, a welcome to our online audience as well. After Senator Sanders' <laughs> remarks, he'll be joined for the Q&A by Arkan Fung, academic dean and Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Citizenship at the Harvard Kennedy School. Bernie Sanders served eight years as mayor of Burlington, Vermont, and 16 years as the state's sole congressperson in the House of Representatives. In 2007, he was elected to the United States Senate, where he is now serving his second term after winning re-election in 2012 with 71% of the vote. <laughs> he is the longest serving independent in US congressional history. And now, please join me in welcoming Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me, let me begin by uh, thanking the Harvard Co-op Bookstore, uh, the MIT Political Science Department, and uh, the Boston Review for co-sponsoring this event. And thank all of you on this beautiful spring day <laughs> for coming out. And if I get distracted, it's because I'm trying to figure out how do we get back to Vermont tonight? <laughs> or do we spend the night in Boston? But um, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, and thanks uh, for your interest in the book, uh, which I, I kind of think is a pretty good book. So it's, uh, and the book is essentially two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, biographical, and it talks about how we become the people we become, what were the influences in my life uh, that led me in the direction that I went. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with being uh, a young Jewish kid growing up in Brooklyn, New York, in a three and a half room. All right, Brooklyn. <laughs> in a three and a half room rent controlled apartment. And uh, growing up in a family that did not have a lot of money, uh, in a family that, as most families in that situation, uh, have uh, uh, living in a lot of tension, uh, where you know my mom, my mother had desires uh, to uh, maybe make it into the middle class, and it just didn't happen. Uh, and the tensions and, and the consciousness that you have about not having a lot of money. Uh, and that is obviously something that stayed with me uh, throughout my entire life. And the reality is, as I'll be discussing in a moment, and sometimes it's easy to forget. When you make it to the middle class or the upper middle class, you forget that right now there are tens of millions of people uh, all over this country who literally don't know uh, how they're going to provide halfway adequately for their children, uh, or if they're older, how they're going to retire with any shred of dignity or whether they're a single mom, how they're gonna afford decent childcare for their kids when it would require half of their income to do that, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is, uh, it is easy 
to forget, and media is not helpful in this respect, that in the country today, there's a lot of desperation and fear and anxiety uh, about what's going on uh, economically. So as a kid growing up, not in a poor family, I mean, we never had some of a question of whether we ate or not. My father worked all the time. It was just you know, never enough money uh, to do the things uh, that my mother would have liked to do. We never quite made it uh, to the middle class. My mother's dream was maybe someday owning a home of her own, and that never happened. We never made it out of a rent-controlled apartment. Uh, I moved to uh, the state of Vermont in uh, 1964, uh, bought some land there uh, with my first wife, got involved in politics uh, in uh, the very late 60s, early 70s. You are looking, I think, at the only United States senator in the history of our country who first ran for office and received 2% of the vote. <laughs> and then ran a year later and received 1% of the vote. <laughs> and then ran and received 4% and then 6% and then finally had the brains to say, all right, maybe I won't get elected anything uh, and I'll let it be. Uh, but then a few years later in 1981, um, a friend of mine uh, concluded, having gone over some election results, that I, while I only got 6% uh, of the vote statewide in, in the last election. I actually got 12% of the vote in Burlington, Vermont, and actually in some of the working class areas had done much better than that. And he said, you know what? If we focus on Burlington, uh, maybe you can win. Uh, and what we put together was really an extraordinary campaign, which is kind of consistent with what I do today. And that is, we do what used to be called, I don't know what the term is today, coalition politics. And that means we brought every single group that you could possibly think of together. And I always had the nightmare that if all of those groups were in one room at the same time, it would have been a disaster. <laughs> but uh, you know, we had, um, we had a lot of support from people uh, who lived in the low-income housing projects who felt the city was not responding to their needs, low-income organizations. Uh, we had support from the city's unions. Uh, we had support from environmental groups that had serious concerns about a number of issues taking place uh, in the city. We had support uh, from uh, neighborhood organizations, one of whom was concerned about a major artery, a major road going right through their community. Uh, we had support, and actually at the end of the campaign, what was pivotal, we ended up winning the support of the Burlington Patrolmen's Association, the police union, and having environmentalists and women's groups and low-income groups uh, working with the police union uh, kind of took us over the top. And on election night, we won by 14 votes. And after the recount, we won by 10 votes. <laughs> uh, and in winning that election, and I, I think back about it with a lot of joyous feelings, because it really was quite, I came into office, we then had a mayor and 13 members, what was then called the Board of Aldermen, now called the City Council. Uh, and the two people who came in with me uh, one was a 75-year-old woman who had been kind of kicked out of the local Democratic Party. I ran as an independent. She had been kicked out of the local Democratic Party because she stood up for her neighborhood. And the other one was a 27-year-old uh, progressive who was, I think, the first Citizens Party candidate ever elected in America. So you could see the breadth of the coalition, a senior conservative Democrat and a progressive uh, environmentalist and me are taking on the combined Democratic and Republican parties of the largest city in the state of Vermont. And that was an interesting process. Uh, and without going into all of the very interesting details, some of which I go into in the book, uh, at the first very, very first meeting of the city council, uh, they fired the one person I had appointed uh, to try to tell me that they were running the city and I was kind of uh, an aberration, and two years later they were going to get rid of me, but I was not going to do anything. And what we did is essentially taking on 
the entire business community, taking on a lot of state government, taking on the Democratic Party, taking on the Republican Party. We put together this extraordinary coalition, and we put together a political movement which was first called the Independent Coalition, later became the Progressive Coalition, later became the Progressive Party in the state of Vermont, which, by the way, today has uh, significant representation in the state legislature. I would say that Vermont has had more success emanating from that in third party politics, progressive third party politics, than any state in the country, and it came from there. But what we had to do is gain, and it's a lesson that we are working on today, same lesson, and that is when you have everybody in the establishment against you, how do you move a progressive agenda forward? And the answer is you go out to people. And historically, city council meetings in Burlington, like city council meetings all over the country, are usually attended by nine people, uh, six of whom managed to stay awake throughout the meeting. <laughs> but what we did is we really energized the community. And hundreds of people were coming out to city council meetings because we were dealing with issues that were relevant to people's lives. We were dealing with youth issues, and we were dealing with health care issues, and we were dealing with infrastructure issues, and we were dealing with senior citizen issues, and we were dealing with tax issues. And we urged people to become involved in the process. And essentially, because I had no real power, when I first became mayor, we, we essentially set up an alternative form of government. Literally had an alternative form of government what little money I could get. We did things like start a little Little League program, start an arts program, which is continuing to this day, where we have these beautiful concerts outside in the evening, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then a year later, a year later, there was an essential, a referendum on how I was doing as mayor, because half of the city council came up. And we worked our tails off with our group of people. And on election night, we cleanly won three seats which now gave us five seats and veto power. Two other seats were in runoff. You need to get 40% of the vote, and nobody got 40%. Democrats and Republicans opposed us on those two seats, uh, but event and we lost. But we ended up with five seats, veto power, and that changed the direction of Burlington. And I think if you go to Burlington now, and I urge you to do so, you'll find it as one of the more beautiful, livable cities in the United States of America, and it started way back there. Um, Uh, in, uh, when I was mayor, uh, as an independent, taking on Republicans and Democrats, I ran for governor of the state in 1986, and it, was a, it was a, and it was an interesting campaign, and some of the issues that were raised then, some of the process is relevant today. Uh, I ran against a governor who was a Democrat, uh, who was a liberal Democrat, as a matter of fact. Uh, but in my view, was not anywhere nearly as strong as he should have been on working class issues. And we ran against uh, a Republican, a strong Republican as well. Uh, and it was an interesting campaign. And, you know, in this, if you're interested in politics, this stuff is really interesting because you know, running as, a, in a sense, a third party candidate, an independent candidate, what people were saying is, well, you're going to be a spoiler and, and so forth and so on. But, Throughout the campaign, we ended up gaining more and more support. And while we only ended up with 14% of the vote, it was an impressive total. We were heavily outspent. Two years later, I ran for um, the United States Congress. And people again said, don't run, you're a spoiler. You know, you're going to elect the Republican. Turned out quite the opposite. We came within three points of the Republican. And the Democrat in that race ended up being the spoiler. Uh, two years later, we won, and Vermont only has one seat in the House, uh, and I won that seat by 16 percentage points and won re-election for the next five elections. Uh, in 2000, uh, spending a total of 16 years in the House. And then in 2006, um, I ran for the United States Senate. At this point, I had the support, virtual support of the Democratic Party, took on the wealthiest guy uh, in the state of Vermont, he spent more money uh, than anybody had ever spent many times over in Vermont, but we ended up winning that election by a two-to-one vote. We won by 31 percentage points. Um, and, and I won re-election uh, six years later, and I'm up in two years.
well, see you now, that's where I'm up. Um, coming to think of it, should pay attention to that actually. <laughs> uh, um, a few years ago, uh, it seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't, um, people came up to me and said, you know, Bernie, it might be a good idea if you ran for president of the United States. And uh, at that point, what you have to appreciate is I think you do. Uh, I was a senator from a, one of the smallest states in this country. We had very, very little money. We had very little name recognition outside of Vermont, maybe New England. And what people were kind of saying, and then I go into this somewhat in the book, is that, look, uh, it is important to have a real debate on some of the most important issues facing this country. And if uh, there is not a strong progressive in the race, we feel that some of those issues will be glossed over and not really discussed. The idea of running for president of the United States uh, when you know almost nobody around the country, when you're outside of the mainstream of the Democratic Party, uh, when you have no money, uh, was a very daunting task. And we thought about it long and hard. Uh, but I finally concluded that, in fact, nobody else was going to do it, and that it was absolutely imperative that issues like income and wealth inequality issues like poverty, issues like climate change, uh, issues like a corrupt political system and a rigged economy, issues like a broken criminal justice system and the need for comprehensive immigration reform, et cetera, et cetera, that those issues had to be pushed into the forefront of American discussion. So, you know, we began to think about it, and, and you know, what do you do? Who, who knew? I mean, we didn't know anything. Uh, none of us had been involved in a presidential campaign. So what we did uh, is uh, just uh, a colleague of mine and I, we started just going around the country, in a sense, literally testing the water. Is there support, we asked ourselves, for a strong progressive message? And, and this is what I worried about, and I, again, I talk about it in the book. What I did not want to see happen is that the ideas that progressives believe in, I did not want to see those ideas damaged if I ran and did very poorly. All right, I believe, and we're gonna introduce legislation to that effect within a couple of weeks in a Medicare for All single payer program. I believe in the absolute necessity of transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. But what I didn't want to happen, and this was the danger, and it really worried me, is if I go forward with a progressive agenda, you know, we get 5% of the vote, and then I'm obliged to drop out, we don't have any money, any support, then what happens is our opponents say, well, there it is. This is not what the American people want. Sanders talked about health care for all. That's not what the American people want. He talked about income and wealth inequality. It's not an issue. That's not what the American people really believe in. And that was what worried me the most. It worried me the most that we would go forward, uh, go into Iowa, which was the first state to have uh, an election, a caucus, get beaten badly, do badly in New Hampshire, not raise any money, drop out. And my ego wasn't of concern. It was that the views that I was trying to espouse, which in fact are the views of many millions of Americans, would be dealt a very heavy blow because we did poorly. And that was the responsibility uh, that, I was, that I was thinking about and worrying about. Anyhow, so we said, all right, let's see what's going on. Let's, let's get out of here and let's hit the road and see if there is any interest. And that's what we did. We went to places, you know, we dropped in, needless to say, to Iowa. Uh, and, and, you know, just probing around. And we knew virtually nobody. We got to meet some great progressives in Iowa. And we had a meeting in Des Moines. And lo and behold, five or 600 people showed up, which was a very large turnout at that 
early stage before I was even a candidate. And you know, we went to places. The other thing, and I believe this today and we'll talk about it later, I'm not a big fan of this blue state, red state business. I don't believe in that. Uh, I believe that in every state in this country, uh, working class people are the majority of the people. And if we do our job right, every one of those states should become a progressive state. So we went. So where we went, we went to Mississippi. We went right to Mississippi. And we had an extraordinary meeting, which I will never forget. We had a meeting uh, sponsored uh, by um, a local union in Jackson, Mississippi. Two or 300 people showed up, which was a very big surprise to everybody, black, white. And we talked. And we talked about how in one of the poorest states in the United States of America, the people there keep electing extreme right-wing corporate types to state government and to the Senate, elected officials who work day and night against the working people who have put them in power. And of course, you know, when we talked and talked, the answer came down to race, obviously. Almost all whites vote Republican uh, in the state of Mississippi. And why is that so? What can we do to address it? It was, a, it was a, just a very moving and interesting discussion. Uh, we went to Alabama, to Birmingham, Alabama. Fantastic discussion. Uh, we went all in many parts of the country, and what we found, we went to, we were in Texas, and went to Austin, Texas, which is a, a progressive oasis in a conservative state. And uh, we were driving there, we was getting late for the meeting, and there was, the traffic was not moving. And I said, damn it, we're gonna be late, this is not good. It turns out there was a traffic jam getting into the meeting. And, uh, you know, the place was just, um, you know, exploding with people who were literally hanging off the, uh, the windows. And uh, so what I ended up concluding was that, in fact, there was an audience for a progressive message that all over this country, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon, we're in Los Angeles, beautiful Sunday afternoon, and, you know, we had many hundreds of people coming out. So we are seeing these large turnouts and people say, run, run, we need to get these issues out on the table. We need to discuss them. So uh, we began the campaign. And um, you know, in a nutshell, uh, the campaign far surpassed uh, what our um, imagination could have conceived when we began it. Uh, we ended up. We ended up winning 22 states uh, throughout the country. We ended up getting 46% of the popular vote. And most significantly and most profoundly is that in, I believe, virtually every state, maybe every single state, we won the votes of blacks, whites, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans under the age of 40. We won those votes by big vote. And what was important about that is that I think we showed this country that the future of the Democratic Party and in fact, the future of this country will be and must be based on a progressive vision, not a conservative vision, but a progressive vision. That is the future of this country. So the book you know, talks about the extraordinary, um, extraordinary opportunity and, 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 and you know, uh, just what it means to, we ended up going to, I think, 47 states around this country, meet, meeting just unbelievable people, unbelievable people. And as I often say, and let me repeat to you, I left the campaign, Trump notwithstanding, I left the campaign far more optimistic about the future of this country than when I began.
I remember being right here in Boston. I think we had, I don't know, we had 17, 20,000 people out in your convention center or something. I remember being in rural areas in California, just an extraordinary, in the evening, beautiful evenings. And you see thousands of young Latino kids and black kids and white people, and not just kids, working class people coming together demanding fundamental change in this country. And that whole experience going all over this country, starting in Burlington, Vermont, went to my surprise. You know, we wanted to kick off the campaign. Should we do it in a church that we often use, which had 500 people? And then my wife said, no, you got to do it outside. We do it outside. We did it on Burlington's waterfront. 6,000 people showed up, and on and on. And you walk out to the um, arena with the Portland Trailblazers pay, I guess, in, in Portland, Oregon. You got 28,000 people out there, and 27,000 people in LA and Seattle and all of this stuff. And you leave the campaign trail saying, and having talked to like one, I think one and a half million people in rallies all over this country, there is a lot of beauty in this country. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. A lot of extraordinarily good people who want this country to become what I think you and I know that it can become, and they want to get involved and are getting involved in the political process. So on a personal level, uh, the campaign for me was obviously an experience that was deeply moving, and it's something uh, that I will never forget. And to all of you who are helpful in the campaign, on a personal level, let me thank you all very much. Now, what the book is about, in a sense, what the campaign was about. I am not a big fan of personal attacks against people. I've never run a negative political ad in my life. Uh, you know, and, and to me, what democracy is supposed to be about uh, is not very complicated. It's not a complicated process. It is people coming together to ascertain what the problems are that we face, and then figure it out. Where do we go from here? Here's the problem not radically different than walking into a doctor's office with an ailment and wanting to get a diagnosis and a therapy that will make you well. That's kind of what it's about. Where are we? What are the problems? How do we go forward? That's about it. And that's what I kind of focused on during uh, the campaign. I know people were angry at me that I wasn't beating up Secretary Clinton enough, but that's not who I am and that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do is talk about the real issues. And I think when people start gravitating toward those issues, it moves the whole political process in a more progressive way. Um, the issues that we talked about were the grotesque levels of income and wealth inequality, which I believe is not only a profound issue, but a moral issue, and we have a chapter on that in the book. As a nation, we have got to determine whether or not it is morally acceptable that the top one-tenth of one percent now owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90%. Whether it is morally acceptable that one family, the Walton family, now owns more wealth, more wealth than the bottom 42% of the American people, one family. Whether it is acceptable that when moms and dads and kids are working incredibly long hours, and we work as a people, some of the very longest hours of any people in the industrialized world. Yet despite all of that, 52% of all new income created today goes to the top 1%. That's not only an economic problem, it is again a moral problem. We have got to ask ourselves what goes on and why is it that we remain the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a right. And we've got a chapter on that in, in, in the book as well. And one of the things that we were able to do in the campaign, despite some of the problems we had with the corporate media, is ask questions. How does it happen that 50 miles from where I live in Burlington, Vermont, in Canada, they managed to have a single-payer system guaranteeing health care to all people, and they spend about a half as much per capita as we do. And if you go to the UK, you go to France, you go to Germany, you go to Scandinavia, all of those countries manage to provide health care at a fraction of the cost that we spend per capita. 
and just asking those questions, which are not asked in Washington. Asking those questions, how can other people guarantee health care as a right, do it in a much more cost-effective way? How come prescription drugs in this country are two, five, ten times more expensive, same exact medicine than they are in France, UK, uh, New Zealand, et cetera? Just putting those questions out on the table forces people to think. And then we raised other issues uh, as the campaign uh, progressed, not just about economics, uh, although economics was very important. Issues about a broken criminal justice system. Question, simple question. Why is it that the United States of America has more people in jail today than any other country on Earth? China is a communist authoritarian country, I think four times our size. We have more people in jail than China does. How does that happen? What are the causes? Why? What do we do about the so-called war on drugs? What do we do about racism existing in law enforcement all across this country? How do we address that? People got involved in that discussion. We have right now today in America, as you all know, 11 million people who are undocumented. These are folks who came, in many cases, across the border uh, out of economic desperation. Many of them are working hard today. They're raising the kids. vast majority are law-abiding. And they came into this country because they knew that with a wink and a nod, they were going to get work. They were going to get a jobs. And they got jobs from some very wealthy and powerful people. Some of you may know. The Trump Towers, owned by uh, the President of the United States, that was built with hundreds of undocumented Polish workers. But all across agriculture, many, many undocumented people. How do we get people out of the shadows? How do we give people dignity? How do we give them legal protection? How do we move toward comprehensive immigration reform? So that is on the table. We live in a highly competitive global economy. And yet insanely, and it really is insane for anybody concerned about the future of this country, today we have hundreds of thousands of bright young people, kids who have done well in high school, who cannot go to college because of the high cost of college. We have many others including, I am sure, many in MIT and at Harvard, who graduate school fifty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in debt, and you go to graduate school, those numbers will double or triple. Talk to a, a doctor in Burlington. She graduated medical school, $300,000 in debt. Young dentist in Iowa, $400,000 in debt. And you step back. You step back for a moment. You say, this is insane. If we are going to compete internationally, we've got to have an extremely well-educated population. Why are we making it difficult, virtually impossible, for young people to get the education they desperately need? And that led me to conclude that what we have got to do, as many other countries around the country do, is make public colleges and universities tuition free and substantially lower. and substantially lower the kind of outrageous student debt that millions of people are carrying right now. And yet, and you got images that come to me throughout the campaign. We talk about this all of the time. Small groups, larger groups. Some guy in Nevada jumps up and he says, you know, Bernie, I'm 55 years of age. I am more in debt now than I was uh, after I left college. And I am worried that they're going to start garnishing my Social Security in order to pay my student debt. Insane. Insane. Talk to a woman in New Hampshire, small meeting. And she says, Bernie, I'm not just paying for my daughter's student debt. I'm paying for my own. She didn't have a whole lot of money. So then you begin to think big. And you say, if you want the best educated workforce in the world, We've got to make sure that we encourage kids to get that education, not leave them crippled with debt, which impacts their lives uh, for decades. So you know, you, you talk, start talking about that, and people say, yeah, that's, that's right. And we've got to move in that direction. You talk about the issues of climate change. It is profoundly, uh, I, I don't know what the word to use here, embarrassing perhaps, that we have 
virtually the entire scientific community, not only in this country, but all over the world, who understand that climate change is not only real, obviously, it is caused by human activity, but most significantly, already, today, it is causing devastating problems in terms of rising sea levels, drought, floods, destruction of ocean life, uh, et cetera. And everybody in the world understands it, except the guy who's sitting in the Oval Office. And this, and this is very, very serious stuff. Because if we do not transform our energy system uh, away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy, I've got seven grandchildren, beautiful grandchildren, all of them. And I worry, honestly and deeply, about the kind of planet that we're going to be leaving to those kids and to kids all over the world. Uh, and you have the unbelievable irony that in the last few days, you got Exxon Mobil, the largest oil company in the country or in the world, telling the President of the United States that climate change is real. That's how absurd the situation is. Um, I think the lesson maybe that I learned uh, from the campaign is that we are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. That's not something we are reminded of by media very often. And by the way, at the end of the book, if you get bored through the middle, go to the end. <laughs> there is a good chapter on, on corporate media. And the critique of corporate media, not that it's fake news or not that people are against Bernie Sanders, is that for whatever reason, and that we can talk about it later, there is a tendency on the part of corporate media to talk about a whole lot of things except usually what are the most important issues impacting most people. And um, we tried during the campaign to just time and time again. I went to Indian reservations. Some of you are familiar with uh, Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And we went, it's in the middle of nowhere, and we went there because I wanted to focus attention on a situation which is disgraceful beyond belief. You have unemployment off the charts, totally inadequate health care and education, youth suicide rates unspeakably high, drug addiction very strong, alcoholism. Wanted to focus attention on the issue without success, without success. Media was there, not particularly interested. Went to California, talked about a variety of issues, fracking, et cetera, et cetera. Media not particularly interested. So, what our job is as, as a nation, I think, is to demand that we focus on the real issues facing the American people. Issues not only environmental and climate change issues, not only health care issues, but issues of the collapse of the American middle class. To ask why today, with all of the exploding technology which makes every worker in America more productive, why are people working two or three jobs? Why is the average worker today working 46 hours a week. Why are people working under such kind of stress? Why, why is that so? And etc. cetera, it, well, that's essentially part of the, right, but how do we go from here to there? How do you create an economy that works well for all people? And then understanding that when you have this grotesque level of income and wealth inequality, the billionaires are not putting the money under their mattress. They are investing it in the political process. So you've got the phenomenon of the Koch brothers, who are prepared to spend many, many hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're not alone, in order to buy the politicians who will protect their interest. So how do you revitalize American democracy? How do we create a situation of one person, one vote, rather than billionaires buying elections? How do we deal with voter suppression, where you have cowardly Republican governors who can't defend their ideas, and the only way they win election is by making it harder for poor people and people of color and older people and young people to vote. How do we deal with that? So, the conclusion is, is really, in my mind, not complicated. And that is, especially with, oh, let me just say a word or two about uh, Trump. How could I forget? <laughs> And point number one, and not everybody in this room will agree with me, uh, 
But I do not believe in any way, shape, or form that the vast majority of Trump supporters are racist and sexist and xenophobes and homophobes. I don't believe that. And I think if you think that is the issue, you're missing the boat big time. I think what Trump understood is that while the economy today, and after eight years of Obama, was far, far better than it was when Bush left office, and that's clearly true, despite that, there were pockets in this country impacting millions and millions of working class people where all of these economic gains passed them right by. And there were levels and areas of desperation in this country hard to describe. During the campaign, again, I intentionally went there. I had read about this. There is a county in West Virginia. It's called McDowell County in the southern part of West Virginia. It used to be big coal country, and the coal companies have left. McDowell County has the rather dubious distinction of having the lowest life expectancy of any state, or any county in, in America. They are living there something like 18 years shorter lives than the people in Fairfax County, Virginia, six hours away by car. And it turns out that McDowell County, West Virginia is not unique. That all over this country, we are seeing what the sociologists refer to is is diseases of despair, is that people are turning to opioids, they're turning to heroin, they're turning to alcohol, they're turning to suicide because of the hopelessness they feel in their lives. Throughout modern history, the trend in our country and around the world has been that we will live longer lives, everything being equal, than our parents, who live longer lives than their parents because of improvements in medicine and healthcare and public health, environmental protection, et cetera. Some of you know this, that right now in America, millions of working class whites are now seeing significantly reduced life expectancy. They're living shorter lives than their parents. What do we do about that level of despair? Well, Trump ran a presidential campaign, which was clearly uh, outside of the box, he, to say the least. And, you know, we can go into it at, at length. But one of the things that he did is he said, I, Donald Trump, hey, I'm not your typical, I'm not your typical Republican. I am not going to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. I'm going to take on Wall Street. I'm going to take on the pharmaceutical uh, industry. I'm going to transform our disastrous uh, trade policies. I'm going to raise the minimum wage. I am going to stand up for you working class people. Well, that was what he said on the campaign trail. Turns out, and this will not surprise you, that he lied. <laughs> Turns out, sadly, that Donald Trump is a fraud and that what he promised working people throughout this country was never what he intended to deliver. When he talked about draining the swamp and getting special interest out of Washington, well, turns out that he hired a half of Goldman Sachs to come into his administration, drained the swamp by bringing in his chief financial advisor, the former president of Goldman Sachs, a company, financial institution, that was fined $5 billion for illegal act activity during the subprime mortgage crisis. Turns out that he has more billionaires in his cabinet than any president in history. Turns out that the people he appoints to be head of the budget, to be head of health and human services, are people who have dedicated their public lives to figuring out ways to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Those are the people he has appointed. So where we are right now, let me give you the good news and the bad news and maybe the good news. The good news is that because millions of Americans stood up and fought back, went to town hall meetings, marched 
in the Women's March in Washington. Participated in healthcare events all over this country. Right. I know you had a beautiful event right here in Boston. You had thousands of people coming out. And what people were saying is, no, we're not going to repeal the Affordable Care Act. We're going to make it better. And in my view, we've got to continue the movement toward Medicare for all. But anyhow, as a result of that grassroots activism, we defeated the Trump-Ryan health care proposal. So if anybody, if anybody asks you, does activism matter? Does it matter if we bombard Capitol Hill with phone calls so that some senators' phone lines were virtually shut down? Does it matter if we go to town hall meetings? The answer is, yeah, it matters. There were town hall meetings that Republicans had scheduled, and I expected, I expect that they thought that they would have 50, 100 people showing up to talk about why we should cut Social Security and give tax breaks to billionaires. But they found a 1,000 people there, and they found people standing up, like some guy did and said, if you repeal the Affordable Care Act, my wife is going to die, and I'm not going to let you do that. And all over the country, that is what was happening. And that is the effort that we have got to continue. And here is the truth. On e virtually, not every, but on virtually every major issue, the American people are on our side. And I'm not talking about Massachusetts. I'm talking about Georgia, and I'm talking about Wyoming. You go out and you ask people, do you think it makes sense, as the Republican leadership wants, to give many hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to the 1% and cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. There is no state in the union, none, not the most conservative, who believes that makes any sense whatsoever. But these guys get away with that crap because they assume, often correctly, that most people don't know what's going on and they can do anything they want to do. I'll give you one example, and I want you to think about this. The majority leader in the United States Senate is Mitch McConnell. His colleague from Kentucky is Rand Paul. Mitch McConnell coming, is coming from Kentucky, a state that has benefited perhaps as much as any state in reducing the number of uninsured people. Okay? It has been, the Affordable Care Act has been quite successful in Kentucky. Mitch McConnell is leading the effort to throw hundreds of thousands of people in his own state off of health insurance, in many cases the first time in their adult lives they've ever had health insurance. How does he get away with that? He gets away with that because he assumes, correctly so, most people don't know what's going on, most people don't know how to organize politically, many of the people who are receiving Medicaid don't vote. And he could do what he wants with impunity, because there's no opposition. And he also assumes, quite correctly, that the Democratic Party is extremely weak and incapable of organizing people. So what is our job? What is our job? Our job is not a radical concept. Our job is to organize and educate people together around a progressive agenda which demands that Congress represent us, not just the 1%. That's about it. Nothing more complicated than that. But to make that happen, we're going to need radical transformation of the Democratic Party. I don't want to offend anybody, but the Democratic Party cannot continue to be the party just of the liberal elite and people who have money. Yeah. 
It has got to be the party of the working class of this country. The Democratic Party cannot just be a party that does well in New England and on the West Coast. It has got to be a 50-state party. It is embarrassing, it is incomprehensible that in the poorest states of this country, the poorest states, you have some of the most reactionary statewide leadership. Okay. But I do want to say, and let me end on this note, that for a variety of reasons, I think some having to do with my campaign, maybe more having to do with Donald Trump, the American people are in fact waking up. And what we're seeing from coast to coast is people becoming involved in local politics, uh, in statewide politics, in a way that we have not seen in a very, very long time. So I conclude by saying that this is a pivotal moment in American history. If we are smart, we can explain to our brothers and sisters all over this country in West Virginia, in Kentucky, in Tennessee, all over this country, what a right-wing extremist agenda is about, an agenda that benefits the billionaire class at the expense of everybody else. Trump has put those issues as clearly as possible on the table. We can explain to every young person in this country what a disastrous environmental approach Trump is taking. We can explain to all of our people that we will not allow ourselves to fall for Trump's desire to divide us up based on the color of our skin or the nation we come from or our religion. Every person here knows the rocky road that this country has gone through uh, since its inception when immigrants came to this country and took the land of the Native Americans. All right, we all know, we know about slavery, we know about 100 years ago, 100 years ago, women in America not being able to vote, let alone get the education or the employment that they wanted, all of 100 years ago. We know what homophobia did to so many people who were unable to openly express their sexual orientation. We know about the prejudice against the Catholics and the Jews and the Irish and the Italians and everybody else. We know that. And the good news is that we have made real progress. The fact that we elected and re-elected an African American as President of the United States is no small thing. The fact that gay marriage today is legal in 50 states in this country. The fact that while we still have a very long way to go, there's no question but that sexism is on the defensive. So here's the point. All right? The point is that as a nation, we have struggled too long and too hard. Too many people died in the struggle. You think about the unnamed people in the civil rights movement who were beaten to death, who were lynched. You think about the women who went to jail fighting for women's rights. You think about Stonewall and the, the fighting done by gay activists. You think about all of that stuff, the immigrant community and what it has tried to do. And our message to Donald Trump is, Mr. Trump, we are not going backwards. We are going forwards. You're not going to divide us up. So with that, let me bring out Professor Fung and let's get to some questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
Senator Sanders, on behalf of the Harvard Bookstore, the Boston Review, and the MIT Political Science Department, thank you for speaking with us tonight. And thanks also to our wonderful audience here in Kresge Auditorium and the many folks watching on the live stream. We've got some great questions from the floor. The first question is, what are your marching orders for someone here tonight or someone watching the live stream who wants to join our revolution? Is it to run for local office and improve local government like you did in Burlington? Join a group like Move On or Indivisible or Black Lives Matter? Change the Democratic Party? Do something else? What are well, your marching orders? It's all of that and more. Uh, I think the main message, this is the main message. You know, every community is different. Everybody is different. And somebody is interested in environmental issues. Somebody is interested in racial justice issues. Somebody is interested in the trade union movement, economic issues, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody's going to do something a little bit different. But here is the bottom line. The people on top get away with their absurd policies because they assume, A, people don't know what's going on. The media won't report it or that people are given up to such a degree that they're not capable of fighting back, or that they could always raise enough money in a campaign to run lying 30-second ads on and they'll win anyhow, et cetera, et cetera. The truth is the agenda of the corporate elite of Wall Street today, never forget, I got these guys from the Business Roundtable. Anybody know what the Business Roundtable is? Business Roundtable are the leaders of the major corporations in America, Wall Street, General Electric, all these guys. And these guys come in, and I'm on the budget committee, the ranking member, and they come in and they say, this is what we, the business leaders of America, want you to do. We want you to cut Social Security and give huge tax breaks to corporations and big businesses. And I asked these guys, we had done a little bit of research, and I can't remember the exact number, but needless to say, every one of these CEOs on the business roundtable had millions of dollars in a retirement program for himself or herself. So these guys got millions of dollars in which to retire. They got a golden parachute when they leave, and they had the chutzpah, <laughs> the goal to walk into Washington, D.C., and say, I want you to cut Social Security for somebody making $14,000 a year benefits. Cut Medicare, cut Medicaid. Give more tax breaks to the people on top. This is such an outrageous agenda that it fails when it is seen in the light of day. But the problem is, for a variety of reasons, it is not seen in the light of day. And then the discussion gets diverted to guns, it gets diverted to abortion, et cetera, et cetera. Our job, ultimately, is to be involved in the political process in every way possible. That means do not turn your back on the local school board. That is a very, very important institution, especially if we want to strengthen public education in America. You know, and then there are city councils and there are state legislatures, et cetera, et cetera. But it is not only getting involved in electoral progress. We win victories when people stand up and fight back on environmental issues. New York State banned fracking. It wasn't because the governor there woke up one day and decided to do it. It was because hundreds of thousands of people suggested to him that it would be a very good idea for him to do it. <laughs> Minimum wage all over this country. It's an extraordinary success story. If somebody in this room five years ago, no time at all, Say, you know, Bernie, minimum wage in Washington now, federal minimum wage, seven and a quarter an hour. Why don't you raise it to 15 bucks an hour? Anybody said that five years ago, person next to you would have thought you were crazy. All right, 15 bucks an hour from seven and a quarter, you're nuts. Well, you know what happened? You had very brave people, workers in the fast food industry, and I've been honored to march with them, who stood up and said, we can't make it. We can't make it on nine, 10 bucks an hour. And lo and behold, Seattle, Washington, 15 bucks an hour, San Francisco, California, New York State. It spreads and it is spreading like wildfire. All right, it, that's what happens when the grassroots start moving. Now, all of you know this 
Trump's ideas about the environment are not only disgraceful, they're needless to say, very dangerous. The way we defeat them is when millions of people start putting pressure on institutions. Not an accident that Exxon Mobil, General Electric said, oh yeah, actually climate change might be real, Mr. President. All right. <laughs> when millions of people tell him that we are worried about our kids and our grandchildren and future generations, we can turn that around when we put pressure on those corporations and banks that are investing in fossil fuel industries. When we demand at the local, state, federal level more solar, more wind, more geothermal, et cetera. So the answer is I can't tell any one person what to do. But I will say this, despair is not an option. Now more than ever, we need you to fight back. Thank you very much, Senator. This is a very confusing political time for many of us. There are these many successes. Uh, the resistance to the Trump administration, as you point out, is very, very energetic. Yet, in many places that we look, progressives are losing. Beyond the Trump White House and Republican Congress, Republicans control 32 state legislatures. There are 33 Republican governors. In 25 states, Republicans have a trifecta, right. veto-proof right. majority. In recent elections in the Netherlands, Social Democrats have the lowest percentage in history. French Socialist Party is polling quite poorly. Building upon these points, Rick from Utrecht in the Netherlands, in our audience, says many European countries already have a decent minimum wage, health care for everyone, affordable education, and yet populists like Wilders, Gert Wilders in Netherlands and Lapin in France have gained popularity. Can you help us make sense of the rise of the right in all of these places? Uh, probably not, but I'll say a few words. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, this is not just the Trump phenomenon here. It is, it is clearly an international uh, phenomenon. And I think that what it is, is that you know, and, and is that the world is changing very, very rapidly. And I think whether you are in cold country in the United States, and I want you to think about this for a moment. And I grew up in a house, I was in West Virginia recently, I reminded those people, I'll never forget the large piles of coal outside keeping the house warm. These guys were heroes, going down underneath there, the worst work in the world, many of them die young from black lung disease and so forth and so on. The world has come and passed them. Coal is in decline. It's not Obama's war on coal, it's the you know, transformation of the energy system. So how do you feel? How do you feel if you're 50 or 60 years old, you once had a job, and by the way, a job is not just income. People want to work, they want to feel part of society, they want to be productive. If you're on the outside, the most, I was unemployed when I was a kid for a while, it was very painful. Not just not having money, you're, you're sitting there, you're useless. It's a very painful feeling that people have. People want to be productive members of a community. And I think that for a variety of reasons of which, you know, we take a, a book to describe, and that's not my book, you know, <laughs> is all over this country, even where people have health care and decent education, there's a sense of loss of community, of not being part of something bigger than oneself. So I think, I think our goal has got to be, obviously, we know what the economic issues are, you know, in the wealthiest country, all of our people deserve a decent standard of living. And, you know, I've rattled off some of those issues. But on the other hand, maybe in a deeper, more emotional sense, we have got to create community. We have got to make sure that I care about you and you care about me, that I know that you are worried about my seven grandchildren and I'm worried about your mother who is ill. That when we are part of that community, we're not left out. I think that makes us more human and less likely to start picking and scapegoating minorities, because that's what demagogues uh, feed upon. Um, so, you know, I, I think that sense of community and how we develop that community. I'll give you an example. It's a really interesting thing. A little bit of an aside, but it's interesting. I was up in a high school uh, in northern Vermont a couple of weeks ago, and it's a working class area, not a wealthy area by any means. And I said to the guy who runs the school, I said, well, what percentage of your kids graduate high school? Vermont does fairly well. Uh, I think we have about an 80% graduation rate. 
And he said, well, about 99% graduate. He said, 99%, that's phenomenal. How does that happen? He says, well, we have one uh, staff member, teacher, mentor, whatever, working with 12 kids. We refuse to allow kids to fall through the cracks. In other words, the parents, the adults, the teachers, the principal, the staff there is saying, you know what, I'm sorry, you are not going to drop out of school. We love you and we care about you, and I know you're having a tough time at home. You come into the office and you talk to me. And I know your family's having economic problems. Let's see what we can do. But we are not going to let you go out on drugs. All right? And, and it, this is tough stuff. I mean, it's easier to say a few words about it than do it. But ultimately, I think the answer to the question is I don't believe that people are racist. I don't believe it. I just think that it is a question of creating that sense where we are part of something. It means a lot to me. You know, of course, everybody in Vermont knows who I am. But I walk into a store, and I could cash a check, and everyone would say, OK, no big deal. I didn't have to fill out 48 different forms. Do you know what I mean? That people know. People know who you are. And you're not just another number. You don't have to make 18 telephone calls. I mean, that's, you know, when we talk without you know, detouring, again, we talk about the healthcare system. It's not just that it is expensive and dysfunctional. You know, I will never forget. I had an eye infection. I was in New York City. And I go into the doctor. I wait online. All I see is signs there. Do you have insurance? You got to pay with cash. The only thing this guy seemed to be concerned about is whether I could pay for it. Walk in there. He looked at me for two seconds, fill out an expensive prescription. OK, people want doctors who are concerned about them, who know them, who they can go to, they can call up. They want the teachers. They want to know that their teachers are deeply concerned about their kids. They want to know that their local cops are somebody they can go to if there is a problem. All right? So, and that's what we've got to build. And it's not easy stuff. It is not easy stuff. But I think at the end of the day, creating that type of community is what will address some of the problems we're seeing in this country and around the world. Very good. Thank you, Senator. So Seneca from Anchorage, Alaska in our audience asks, I often struggle to effectively converse with conservative friends and family members about current events. Do you have any advice to facilitate more constructive conversations? Well, it's a real. I mean, as, as all of you know, there's been a lot of stuff written on this, is that one of the problems we have is that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, everybody watched Walter Cronkite on CBS or, you, or somebody else. And, you know, we, we watched the same program and maybe we read the same newspapers. And now uh, that is broken down. So you have a significant number of people who get their worldview from Fox television. Uh, which is different than my website, to say the least. <laughs> uh, you know, which is different than NBC and, and, and so forth and so on. So people are getting a stream of information consistent with what they already look at the world at. So this is it's a very good question, and it's a tough question. Uh, I think basically, though, uh, is it is important for us to go outside our zone of comfort. Uh, it is very, very easy for all of you to sit down with your friends and have a drink and laugh about what a jerk Donald Trump is. But that's not good enough. That really is not. We have to do what this question asks. So I think, and again, I don't suggest this is easy, but most of the people, certainly the working class people who voted for Donald Trump, you know what? They want their family and their kids to have health care. And you say to them, Donald Trump promised you Health care for everybody. That's what he's a great health care system for everybody. But what he delivered, <laughs> what he delivered, if you are, according to the AARP, if you were 64 years of age, your premiums would have gone up from $1,700 to uh, $7,000. All right? Almost half of your income if you were living on $25,000 a year. I think that's roughly right, or maybe more than that. But it was a huge increase in premiums. Do you feel comfortable about that? You voted for Trump. He said he was going to provide health care to all people. Is that a good idea? You voted for Trump, uh, and he said he was going to drain the swamp. How do you feel about billionaires coming in to Washington and all these Wall Street guys now in powerful positions? Is that draining uh, the swamp? 
He said he wouldn't cut Medicaid. He made massive cuts in Medicaid. Do you think it's a good idea that his budget includes ending after-school programs? Doesn't your kid go to an after-school program? Yeah, well, he's ending that. And what about lunch programs for kids? And what about the WIC program for pregnant women and babies cut while he gives tax breaks to billionaires? Is that really what you voted for? So, I mean, it's, and that's a, maybe a way to start the discussion. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a discussion that we, you know, but the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, is these people over the years, many of them were Democrats, and they looked at the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party made a hell of a lot of promises to them. But you know what? In many respects, not all, and clearly the Democrats have been much better than the Republicans. But I don't want anybody here to forget it was a Democratic president, not a Republican president, who deregulated Wall Street. It was a Democratic president who made the first major initiatives on disastrous trade policies. Okay, let's not forget that either. So, you know, there you go. And among other things, that's right. That's right. All right, well, we don't have to list all of the things. All right. all right, and they're angry. They're angry, and they look for an alternative. But our job is to deliver the goods. Stand with us. We will take on the billionaire class and these corporations and create a, an economy that works for you. So I, I think that's kind of the way we begin that process. Thank you. I'm afraid we have only time for one more issue. That's because I've talked too long. To explore. You know, sorry, I know but... we could go on a long time. I would like nothing more. Uh, and this, this is a couple of questions from the floor. First is Colin, Colin from Abington asks, in these hyper-partisan times, compromise has become a dirty word on both sides. Given that compromise is a core principle of democracy, how can we cut through the rhetoric and reach compromises across the political spectrum? But coming at the same issue from a different direction, Kevin, Kevin from Arlington asks, or will you adopt the GOP's prior obstructionist tactics and agenda about compromise and values? Okay. I look at it um, a little bit differently in this sense. Of course, compromise is, you know, I've been a mayor and I've been a congressman. I think for a number of years, I ended up getting more amendments through a Republican House than any other member. You don't do that without reaching out to Republicans on issues where there's a uh, common view. So of course, compromise is part of what the dem democratic process is. But I think let's back it up a little bit and take a look at where we are politically in this country today. Where we are is that in the last 30 years or so, the Republican Party move from what we call a center-right party to a right-wing extremist party. I mean, that's just a fact. Uh, in my state of Vermont, we had Republican governors who were really strong environmentalists, protectors of women's rights, uh, strong believers in education, obviously different points of view than I had on economics. We disagreed very profoundly. But these guys lived in what I would call the mainstream world, many. That was the Vermont Republican Party, by the way, throughout its, its modern history. People like George Aiken, Bob Stafford, Jim Jeffords, moderate, solid Republicans. Dwight D. Eisenhower, <laughs> for God's sakes, the man who reminded us of the danger of the military-industrial complex. The guy who said, hey, I'm going to expand Social Security, was a Republican. The guy who built the interstate highway system was a Republican. Okay, so what's happened over the last 30, 40 years is as a result of the Koch brothers and other billionaires, the party has moved very, very far to the right. And it is honestly, I'm not saying it is impossible, there are some Republicans who you can sit down and talk to. But many of them are not, and they are beholden to people like the Koch brothers who fund campaigns. And the Freedom Caucus is, is part of that. The, do you know what the Koch brothers really stand for. Do people know that? I just did an interview on my website with Jane uh, Meyer, Mayer. Anyone know Jane Mayer? And Jane has written a lot of stuff about money in politics and dark money. Koch brothers, this is what they believe. They don't want to cut Social Security or Medicare and Medicaid. They want to end Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. Their philosophy, being the second wealthiest family in America, is that government, this is what they will tell you. They're not liars, they're not hypocrites, give them credit for honesty. 
They believe, their philosophy is government should not play a role in retirement security, ending Social Security, should not play a role in public health, goodbye Medicare, Medicaid, and all other public health programs. They actually don't believe in public education. They don't believe in the concept of government other than perhaps a strong uh, defense and maybe a few other areas. That is their view. You are on your own. You want health insurance when you're old? Well, figure it out. You don't have any money, it's maybe some charity or church will give you some money. That's not what government is about in their idea. And they have contributed hundreds of millions of people who have adopted that. We are fighting to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. You know what their view is on the minimum wage? We should not have a minimum wage. It takes away your freedom. If unemployment is high and I want to hire you for four bucks an hour, it is my freedom to employ you, your right to work for me at four bucks an hour. Government should not establish a standard. That's taking away freedom. You own a factory, you want to, you want to dump your junk into the, your, your pollution into the river, you want to pollute the air, hey, that's freedom. You don't want the government telling you what to do with your property. That's your freedom. That is what they believe, and that is the ideology that is now dominating the Republican Party. And those are the people. You have the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, a guy named Scott Pruitt, whose job is to dismember environmental protection law in America. To dismember it. Everybody knows that. They don't want that's those terrible regulations so that the water you drink and the air your kids breathe will be clean. You want to end all that stuff. Give people the freedom to pollute. So this is what we are up against. Of course you want to compromise. Well, what am I supposed to say to somebody who wants to destroy the Environmental Protection Agency, who doesn't believe in climate change? What's the compromise? You tell me. All right? <laughs> So I think, look, you know, in a democracy, in a nation of 320 million people, you know, everybody's going to have a different point of view. In this room, everybody, you know, everyone has a different point of view. But what you want, at least, is a government which, broadly speaking, represents the people, not a handful of billionaires. And once you have that, once you have members going forward and know, you know of course, Nobody in your community wants to cut Social Security and give tax breaks to billionaires. Okay, how do we address this issue? We can work together. But right now, to me, the major job we have is to build a strong, progressive, grassroots movement where millions of people become active in the political process in a way we have not seen in the modern history of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your fighting for America and inspiring us to fight for America. Thank you very much. It's been fantastic.